So this is week three of our series and our theme for the year, uh, Renew. Um, we've been looking at Romans 12, verse 2, um, where it says, Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. And then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, His good, pleasing, and perfect will. Has anyone been getting anything out of this series if you've missed the past couple of weeks, I would encourage you like never before to go to YouTube or the podcast and catch up. Uh, I listened back to some of this material myself and I was like, man, this guy's good. Uh, <laughs> if there's ever been a series or a, a series of messages that's worth listening to uh, a second time, this is the one. It's not to minimize other topics that we've talked about, but I'm not joking when I say second to coming to the saving knowledge of Jesus this is some of the most impactful content that I've ever studied. Uh, it's not that the content is super deep or difficult to understand. It's not even that the material is new. You know, I said a few weeks ago, this really should be Christianity 101. Uh, but how many of you know that it's often the simple things that are the most difficult? And what does that even mean? Well, the concept of exercise is simple, but it's certainly often to, uh, it's difficult to implement. Anybody no, okay, you guys are awesome. Awesome. Uh, the concept of cutting back on sugar is a fairly simple idea until you try it. And then by day two, you're practically certifiably insane. Anybody else ever deal with that? Listen, I've been chewing and meditating and implementing some of these principles for the last six months. And I can tell you that it's been life changing. And I can also say without hesitation that it is a work in progress. Uh, the things that Katie and I have been learning and trying to implement are a complete new way of doing life. And in a lot of ways, it's completely counterintuitive to culture, including Christian culture. Um, by October of last year, I was a couple of months into this journey of renewing and uh, trying to do some things personally. And one Sunday I made this statement that I believe that God wanted to do a complete deconstruction and then reconstruction in the way that we think and the way that we live. And at that time, I didn't realize it, but I was actually describing the biblical definition for renew found in Romans 12 too, which was to renovate or to make a complete change for the better. Because isn't that what happens when you renovate something, right? You deconstruct something that already exists and then you replace it with something new or you rebuild something old so that the end result is a complete change for the better. I love uh, renovation shows. Anybody else love renovation shows? I think Ty Pennington probably started it all with uh, Extreme Home Makeover. You guys remember that? Anybody love that show? I don't think I ever saw an episode where it didn't have me crying my eyes out on the couch. Anybody else? Uh, one of my favorite shows um, used to be Restaurant Impossible. Anybody seen that show? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Chef Robert Irvine would go into these failing restaurants and do a complete makeover. He'd meet with the restaurant owners and give them the tools that they needed to succeed. They'd change the menu. They'd completely renovate the dining area. Sometimes they'd even change the name of the restaurant. And at the end of the show, I would always Google the restaurant to see how it was doing. And sadly, a very high percentage of the time, it would say closed for good. How could they invest all of this time and all of this money and it's still closed for good? Because a poorly decorated dining room wasn't really the problem. The problem was something internal. And so a renovation of the restaurant wasn't effective without a renovation of the way that the business owners would think and operate. In other words, without a renovation of our mind, put it in, a, in our context, long-term success is not sustainable. Right? We're living in a culture where Christ followers are by and large unhealthy. We look and talk almost identical to our non-Christian counterparts. Right? We come to church, we read our Bibles, we come to the altar, but often our lives remain unchanged and a complete mess. Sure, we've been saved, we've been born again. Remember last week, we talked about how we were made up of three parts, spirit, soul, and body. We are a spirit. We have a soul, which the biblical definition of that in its condensed, condensed form is mind, will, and emotions. That's, that's what makes up our soul. And we live in a body. We can also experience three types of transformations. We looked at that last week. Ephesians 2 talks about spiritual transformation, where we go from being dead in our transgression of sins to being alive in Christ. We looked at body transformation, 
where in 1 Corinthians 15, Paul talks about how when we die or when Christ comes to take us to heaven, our physical bodies, our mortal bodies will be transformed into a spiritual or an immortal body. And finally, soul transformation or mind transformation. That's what we're reading about in Romans chapter 12, verse 2. Again, understanding these types of, of transformation and where they come from is very important. And that's why so many times we're doing the right things on the outside, but there's been no transformation in our soul and in our mind, and we continue to struggle. Spiritual transformation comes from God. He, only He can take a, a person's spirit who's dead in transgressions of sin and bring them to alive in Christ. Body transformation when we die or when Christ comes back can only happen through God. But soul transformation comes through us. Now, let me clarify when I, what I mean when I say soul transformation comes from us. We have to be the ones to invite the Holy Spirit in to heal those deep emotional wounds. We don't heal ourselves, but we can, re, we can reject his offer to bring healing to our mind and our emotions. And so it's up to us. You can be saved and on your way to heaven and still struggling every day of your life because we refuse to change the way that we think. When we die, our bodies will be transformed into a heavenly body. But we can still live a life of bondage and misery because we refuse to renovate the way we think. Without a renewal of our mind, we will never experience the transformation that Paul talks about in Romans 12 too. This is why someone can be a Christ follower and still struggle with fits of rage and outbursts of anger. There's, those are symptoms of an inner life that hasn't been fully healed Lust and perversion, gossip and lying and betrayal, addiction and unforgiveness. These are all symptoms of a soul that hasn't been healed, but they're only symptoms. I said last week, it's the fruit, not the root. And until the root is healed, the fruit will always be sick. Until the inner life is healed, the outer life will always be symptomatic. Always. There are no asymptomatic Christ followers. It's a word we're all familiar with over the last two years. Asymptomatic. There are no asymptomatic Christ followers because what's inside will reveal itself in who you are and in, in the things that you do. If you're following along with us on our soap journey with our booklets and the reading plan, you've read this last week, Matthew 15, verse 19, 19 and 20, where Jesus says, For out of the heart comes evil thoughts, murder, adultery, sexual immorality, theft, false testimony, slander. These are what defile a person. What's in your heart is what defiles us. Matthew 12, 35, a good man, Jesus still talking, brings good things out of the good stored up in him. And an evil man brings evil things out of the evil stored up in him. What is Jesus talking about? He's saying that our inner life affects our outer life. It's the need to order our secret or our private life, because if our secret lives are out of order, eventually it will reveal itself in our public lives. Back to Romans 12, 2. Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Look, we've talked about what conform means, that it's the, the Greek word schema, and it means habitus, which is a way of being, right? Paul's instructing us not to allow our way of being to be unconsciously formed by the culture around us. We've talked about being transformed last week, how that word is where we get our word metamorphosis. That's when we are when we are transformed. It's not just a simply changing of our minds. It's something completely different. It's caterpillar to butterfly. It's tadpole to frog. It's one way of being to a completely different way of being. And then we partially looked at every week the word renew, where it means a renovation or a complete change for the better. But there's a third definition that we've yet to look at. And the root word here for renews is anakinao. And it means to cause to grow up. All right, so Romans 12, 2, it says, Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by growing up in your mind. And then you'll be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. Last week we said that the link between the health of our spirit, our spiritual lives, and the health of our soul is inseparable. We cannot be mature spiritually while remaining immature, immature emotionally or immature in our soul. And sadly, I think we would all agree that there are some very immature Christians out there. But worse yet, none of us think we are one. 
Paul speaks specifically to this in the letter that he wrote to the Colossian church. In Colossians chapter 1, he says, He, meaning Jesus, Jesus is the one we proclaim, admonishing and teaching everyone with all wisdom. Why? And then he goes on. So that we may present everyone fully mature in Christ. To this end, I strenuously contend with all the energy Christ so powerfully works in me. Paul is saying, I'm devoting my life to presenting everyone fully mature in Christ. All of the energy that Christ has given me is being used to this end. Apparently, this was an ongoing issue in the first century church. He addresses it again in his first letter to the Corinthians. In 1 Corinthians chapter 3. He says in verse 2, I gave you milk, not solid food, for you were not ready for it. Indeed, you're still not ready. You're still worldly. For since there is jealousy and quarreling among you, are you not worldly? Are you not acting like mere humans? Look, he's saying, I know you're a follower of Jesus, but you're not acting like people of the Spirit. You're acting just like everyone else. And sadly, it seems like not much has changed in the last 2,000 plus years. If Paul were writing a letter to the modern church, what would he say? It would be found in 1 Americans 1 verse 1. Brothers and sisters, I could not address you as people who live by the Spirit, but as people who are still worldly, mere infants in Christ. Remember the iceberg analogy from last week. Only 10% of the iceberg is visible, while 90% is hidden below the surface. Our lives are similar in nature. Right? The, the outward life is just the tip of the out, iceberg. The inward life is everything beneath the surface. And more often than not, it's what lies underneath the surface that wreaks the havoc in our lives. We can no longer ignore the emotional component or the soul component in our spiritual growth. Because it doesn't matter how many books we read, how much we pray, how many conferences we go to. And I'm certainly not minimizing the importance or the power of these things. I've been impacted greatly and deeply by all of them. But if we continue to ignore the emotional aspect of our lives or the 90 percent that's below the surface or our inward or hidden lives, or to put it in biblical terms, if we continue to ignore our soul, we will remain immature at best, constantly fighting the same battles over and over again. There has to be a better way. God is inviting us to slow down to be with Jesus. He's inviting us to go beneath the surface so that we can be deeply transformed by Jesus. And he's, offering, he's, he's asking us to offer our lives as a gift to the world for Jesus. Be with Jesus, transformed by Jesus, doing work for Jesus. He's inviting us to reject the busyness and the hurry of our lives. To reorient our entire lives around a personal relationship with Jesus. To develop rhythms that allow us to follow Jesus wherever he leads. To intentionally open up the deepest parts of our lives to be transformed by the power of the Holy Spirit. Because we're so good at wearing masks. We're so good at hiding. And that's part of the conformity of the world's way of thinking. And it's worked its way into the church. Oh, if you knew me, you'd reject. If you knew the real me, you'd reject me. Therefore, I must hide the real me at all costs. Second Corinthians 3.18, Paul says, And we all who with unveiled faces contemplate the Lord's glory are being transformed into his image with ever-increasing glory, which comes from the Lord, who is the Spirit. What's he saying? As we remove the veil, as we remove our mask and come into God's presence with complete honesty, we are being transformed. One version says we go from glory to glory. He continues in the next chapter. And remember, in the original, when he wrote this, it was just a letter. There wasn't chapters and verses. He just he continues in 2 Corinthians 4, verse 1. Therefore, since through God's mercy we have this ministry, we do not lose heart. Rather, we have renounced secret and shameful ways. Now, that's powerful. Renounce the secret and shameful ways. We do not use deception, nor do we distort the word of God. On the contrary, by setting forth the truth plainly, we command, that word means present, we present ourselves 
to everyone's conscience in the sight of God. Listen, by renouncing our secrets in shameful ways, by telling the truth plainly, we begin to break the power of Satan in our lives. We don't use deception. I'm no longer going to manipulate you by putting on this mask and making you think something different. I'm no longer going to put on this false self to make you that, think that I'm this way or that way. It's, I'm coming out of hiding. And this goes all the way back to Adam and Eve. And I know I'm bouncing all over the place, but hang on just for a couple more minutes. We'll bring the plane in for a landing. In Genesis 3, 9, it tells us that God called out to them after Adam and Eve had sinned. And he said, where are you? And just like Adam and Eve, just like God called to them, he's calling to us and he's asking, where are you? Come out of hiding. Stop deceiving others. Freedom comes when we begin to renounce our secrets. The word renounce literally means to speak. In a lot of Christian circles, it's frowned upon to give name to the things that we're struggling with. Oh, I can't say I'm struggling with depression because that's an acceptance of the diagnosis. And since God has called me to a life of joy, then admitting that I'm sad is an acceptance of something that's not God's will. Oh, I can't call it cancer because that means I've accepted it into my life. Oh, I can't say I'm struggling with anxiety or worry or fear because that's an admission that I'm struggling and it's the acceptance of the issue. I can't call it what it is because the Bible says to call things that are not as though they were. Listen, there's no power in denying reality. But on the contrary, when we finally get the courage to name it, then we can begin to tame it. Once it has a name, I can begin to fight it. Once it has a name, I can begin to renounce it. Once it has a name, I can begin to deal with it. Once it has a name, I can introduce it to the name above all names. That at the name of Jesus, everything bows. Every person, every sickness, every disease, every sin, every struggle bows at the name of Jesus. Certainly not saying we accept everything that comes to us. Don't hear what I'm not saying. Once we begin to name something, we can begin to tame it. We can begin to fight it. When that anger rises up, instead of pushing it down and hiding and putting on the mask and acting like it's not real, you can name that thing. You can begin to renounce it, speak over it, declare the word of God over it. You know, I'm on this journey of renewing my own mind. Even last night, I struggled. I had a great day. And I know you've been hearing us talk about Sabbath a lot. It's kind of a foreign word, even in the church. And we've been very diligent and intentional, trying to take 24 hours a week. And again, that, I'm going to talk about that in a series that's coming up. But then yesterday, it was just a great day. Started 6 we didn't make it at 6. It was 6.30 on Friday. We're supposed to start at 6, but about 6.30 Friday, we just, there was a 24-hour period until 6.30 p.m. on last night. And it was just a great day. We watched the basketball and hung out, and the girls went shopping. And we did these things that delight, that brought us delight, to bring us joy. And I came up to the church afterwards, and I was working on a few things uh, in the evening. And I went home, and then I had this, like, had this, Bennett was very tired. He didn't get a nap. You know, how many of you know three-year-olds and four-year-olds, their emotions are all over the place, right? They're immature, which is exactly what I'm talking about today. They're immature in the physical realm like we are in the spiritual realm or in our own souls and minds. And just after a great day, like his eyes were bothering him. He got some soap in his eye and he was taking a bath and just turned into this big fiasco. I was trying to put some eye drops in his, in his eyes. He was tired and he was crying. And then, and I just got, I got too worked up. I get in and abuse him. I didn't whatever, but it just turned into this like anger thing. And he went to bed and I pulled him up beside of me before it. I was like, man, I love you so much. And I'm sorry. I just got, you know, I, daddy got worked up and, you know, and then I went in my bedroom and cried while I ironed my shirt. You know, I was like, God, like. I'm talking about being emotionally healthy and renewing our soul. Then the night before, I'm yelling at my kid in a way that was like inappropriate. You know what I mean? I'm like, dude. But I could suppress that and act like it wasn't there, or I could give it a name and say, you know what? I blew it. My anger got the best of me. And then I can reflect and I can begin to say, what, what, what was that? What was that in me that, that caused that to happen? And how can I prevent that from happening in the future? Romans 12, 2, do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, is good, pleasing, 
and perfect will. Now, what does any of this we started given the new de definition of renew, the third part, which is to cause to grow up? What does any of that have to do with the growing up? First of all, Paul gives us an idea of what spiritually immature behaviors are. And he likes it, likens it to believers who are acting just like non-believers or acting just like the world. And I think we can all agree that that's pretty rampant in the church. If we'll be brave enough to look at the 90% of the iceberg that's underneath the surface, we will all see some childish and immature, childlike behaviors. And part of the conformity, where he says do not conform, part of the conforming process is accepting these behaviors as normal. We've lived in it for so long and we've seen it operate so long that it's just normal. But we will never be deeply transformed until we begin to deal with these behaviors. While immature and emotional spiritual behaviors are numerous, right, I've chosen to emphasize just the one. The hiding aspect of it. Now, if you have small kids in your house, you know that hiding is a huge part of their lives. Or at our house, we play all kinds of games that involve hiding ourselves or hiding something we hide under blankets and hide behind the car and jump out and just you know it's part of our life we play hide and seek we play i spy where you hide an object and everybody else has to find it when they're in the car the boys like to play i see something i see see i see something you don't see and the color of it is and then we all have to guess anybody else ever play that yeah. right the boys hide their toys from each other they hide the truth if they've done something wrong or know that they shouldn't have done something they know they shouldn't have done. There are all kinds of reasons that kids hide things. But as we get older, we go from hiding things for fun. A couple of weeks ago, we did a scavenger hunt, you know, with the boys. And it, was, it took them a few little, a few clues to figure out, oh, this is fun. And at first, they didn't know what they were doing. It's the first scavenger hunt they ever did, but we had... We got them a special surprise, and I hid it in the backyard, and we took them on this thing. We were hiding things. So we go, we go from hiding things for fun to just simply just hiding as adults. We hide who we are. We hide our sin. We hide our struggle. We hide our fears. We hide our wounds and our hurts. Sometimes we even hide our success. I'm certainly not encouraging you to tell your secrets to everybody. But I like what Pastor Chris Hodges says, that if you're the only one who knows your secrets, you're in trouble. You don't have to tell them to everybody, but you need to tell them to somebody. Paul is telling us that we cannot experience deep transformation and continue to think like a child and continue to hide all of the time. Unfortunately, hiding is one of the chief childish behaviors that we all participate in. But deep transformational change comes through brutal honesty and vulnerability before God. The English word vulnerable is derived from the Latin word vul, vulnerare, which means to wound. Every person in the world has been wounded in some way. But when we become vulnerable and lay our wounds before God, that is the place that he can begin to bring healing. Look, I know statistically not everyone in the room is picking up what I'm putting down. <laughs> According to the parable of the sower, the story Jesus told, only 25% of the seed fell on good soil. I certainly hope that more than 25% of those who hear this will begin to implement some of the things we've been talking about. But here's the question. What is the Holy Spirit saying to you? What's he saying to you? The first step is honesty. See, some of us in the room want to experience deep transformational change. We want to be healthy emotionally and spiritually. We want to, we want to stop acting like a child. Well, something comes up and you're like, ah, I don't like that behavior. Like for me, last night, I was like, I don't like that. I don't, I don't like that. I want to stop, right? But until I'm honest with myself and I do some deep digging to figure out what's going on, it can never be dealt with. Many of us don't know where to start. And maybe it seems overwhelming. 
You ever been in a mall for the first time and you're looking for a specific store? You don't know where you're going. You're looking for that one store. You don't know where it is. Right? What do, what do you do? You go to the map. All right. So you go to the map and on the map, it usually says what? Keep throw that up. You are here. This speaks to honesty. Because without knowing where you are, you cannot navigate to where you want to be. But only you and the Holy Spirit know where you are. We can ignore things. We can pretend we're not somewhere. You know, if I go to a mall in Orlando, like I, I know the paddock mall, like I know where stuff is. But if I go to a mall in Orlando and I navigate that mall as if I were in the paddock mall, I'll never find what it is that I'm looking for because it's a different location. So what, your location and my location, we're in a different place, but only you know where it is. This is the honesty step. You guys can leave that slide up. You are here. Where are you? What is it that the Holy Spirit is speaking to you? What is he saying to you? Only you know that answer. And without being honest about where you are or where we are, we cannot, we cannot, we will never make it to where God is calling us to be. That's why the first step is an honest assessment of where you are. We need to find, you need to find some quiet time or alone time with God and allow the Holy Spirit to speak to you. The last couple of weeks, you've heard me just mention kind of in passing of trying to incorporate some silence into my devotional time where I'm not I'm not talking. I'm just sitting, listening. I don't even have music on. I'm just sitting in silence. We have to find those moments where we allow. We just think about making room. We have to make room in our lives for the Holy Spirit to speak to us. Where we can honestly evaluate where we are. Where are you? What is it that the Holy Spirit is showing you? Because until we do a, a brutally honest, vulnerable assessment of where we are, we will never reach our destination. And sad to say, we'll never experience the deep transformation that Paul is talking about. Until we do an assessment of where we are and we begin to renew our mind, to transform it, to renovate it, to make a complete change for the better and to grow up, to grow up in the way that we think. Would you bow your heads just for a moment? On behalf of Pastor Randy and the entire staff at Everyday Church, we'd like to thank you for joining us today. For more information on the church, please visit us at everydaychurch.xyz.